Hi, my name is Devin Boss, and I'm going to be talking about why you should use Apache Pulsar, and I'm going to teach you a little bit about some of its architecture and what makes Apache Pulsar so powerful compared to other technologies. So let's talk about why Pulsar. Um, so Stream Native, which is one of the companies that has been largely responsible for maintaining Pulsar, they conducted a survey, and they got a decent response rate. Um, and what we noticed from the respondents is that most of the respondents were at the architect level and the vast majority of them were technical roles. Um, there were also some executive level roles as well in those who responded. And what we noticed is that at Pulsar, although this also included some streaming platforms, um, they, beyond anything else, they increase agility and unlock new use cases for the business. Now, if you watched my previous video on Apache Pulsar, you'll notice I, I talked a lot about this, and so I'm just going to go through some of these things briefly. Um, this is a newer survey that was conducted, and so this is more up-to-date information. And then uh, we'll dive into um, some of the architecture of Pulsar and um, what makes it so powerful. Um, and we notice of the top three highlights for Pulsar, number one was architecture design, which is why we're going to be talking about that more today. Um, and also scalability and reliability were highlighted um, in the top three. Um, and so we notice that archi the architecture of Pulsar, the scalability and its reliability all go hand in hand, um, as well as with all these other features. They're all closely interconnected. Um, now, of the top use cases, PubSub was, uh, was the dominant, uh, but many of these other features have also been used uh, frequently. And here at Overstock, we heavily depend on the multi-tenancy aspect, um, and we also make use of functions and many of the other features as well. Um, so what do what are people using Pulsar stream processing capabilities for? Um, well, asynchronous applications, that was dominant, but also building core business applications, and that's something we've done here at Overstock. And interestingly enough, um, ETL is on this list. Um, a lot of people think of using a technology like Spark or a batch processing engine or maybe Hadoop for ETL, um, but when you use the Kappa architectural pattern, um, you can you can leverage Pulsar even for these kinds of ETL workloads by moving everything to the stream. Um, now talking in more detail about that is out of the scope of this presentation, but I'm just planting a seed here uh, to get you thinking about that because it's very powerful. And we also noticed that of the respondents, um, the vast majority of them um, will be deploying more applications on Pulsar in 2020. Um, and that also aligns with what the figures showed about the budget expectations, and we noticed that 0% of respondents said that the, that the budget for Pulsar will be decreasing. Um, so organizations are not regretting their choice of moving to Pulsar. So who is using Pulsar? Uh, so since I'm here based in the United States, I took some examples here uh, that would be more well known from companies out here, um, and I just want to highlight Splunk as, uh, as an example. They recently conducted um, an acquisition of Streamlio, which was one of the core maintainers of Pulsar, and some of the Pulsar architects were part of that organization. And so Splunk, even, you know, their their entire business platform is built on streaming, and even Splunk is migrating to Pulsar, and they leverage this acquisition to do it. Um, I could talk in more detail about these other companies, but um, I think that's out of scope of this presentation. And then technologies that integrate with Pulsar out of the box. We see this, you know, as a pretty common uh, concept with open source technologies. You know, people in the community, especially when you have a very active community like, like Pulsar has, you folks in the community that build connectors to integrate with various applications, and so we expect that this list will grow significantly in the coming days. Um, also, we encourage those who are interested in building their own custom connectors to please open source them, and uh, I'm certainly working on getting Overstock to open source some of the connectors that we've been working on. Okay, so let's talk about the architecture. Um, so we're going to go through this in a very simplified manner, but hopefully it's going to give uh, some of you a better understanding if you're unfamiliar with Pulsar and some of the technologies, and especially if you're new to distributed uh, technologies in general. Um, so like, for example, if Apache Zookeeper is new to you, then uh, this might be very helpful. Um, so um, the way that I'll be using these icons, uh, on the left, that's Apache Zookeeper, which is our distributed meta store. We use that for things like distributed locks and um, other things we'll be talking about. Um, and then in the middle, this Pulsar icon for this presentation, um, I'll be using it to represent the Pulsar broker, which is for the serving layer. Um, and then on the right side, um, that's Apache Bookkeeper, which is our storage layer. 
Um, and the separation between the broker layer and the storage layer is one of those things that makes Apache Pulsar so powerful. We'll talk about that more. Um, so Zookeeper. Zookeeper is a well-known technology um, in the distributed application space. Um, here is a list of some of the applications that use Zookeeper. There are many others, um, especially there are some projects that are in uh, incubation stage in the Apache um, community, um, and I'm sure that there are many other applications as well as custom applications that make use of Zookeeper. Um, my point here is that uh, it's a technology that's been around a long time, um, and as I mentioned, it's used as a distributed metastore, but it can do more than that. Um, and we're going to walk through a simplified use case of how one might interact with Zookeeper, and for those of you who are new to this concept, I think this will be helpful. Um, so how does Zookeeper work? Okay, so Zookeeper in a nutshell is kind of like a, a distributed file system. Uh, I don't want to say it's a very smart file system because it's kind of dumb, uh, but it's more sophisticated than a typical file system um, because it's distributed and allows you to do certain specific kinds of things like um, like set of locks and uh, get notifications of changes that you can't do with a typical file system. Um, so in this example, um, we have a master node, we have workers, um, we have tasks, and then we have this assignment uh, section. And think of this, you know, as a file system. So we've got these different um, like subdirectories in the file system, and then um, in the workers, you have specific workers that have registered themselves. Um, and so we'll go through that. So let's say you've got a worker. This is worker one. It's coming online. Um, and it notifies Zookeeper of its existence. And so it creates a new entry in this, you know, think of it like a file system um, that indicates where it is and it might contain, it might store other information on that node, um, such as, you know, maybe an IP address or other metadata that might be helpful for uh, allowing other workers to communicate with it. Um, so then let's say that this worker, it sets a watch on the task. But what it's doing here is it's saying, okay, now that I'm online, I want to know about any tasks that become available so that I can pick up work. Um, you know, so think of it like it's trying to take work off of a, some kind of a queue. Um, and so it sets a watch on tasks. It's a simple command, and it'll give you any existing tasks and set a watch on anything that changes. Um, and then the way that watches work in Zookeeper is that after, um, after you're notified through the watch, you then need to um, recreate the watch. Um, so it doesn't just continue giving you notifications, you have to resubmit that. But that's an architectural detail or an implementation detail that we don't have to worry about too much here. Um, so let's say worker one, it sets this watch to get the next available task. And let's say that, you know, worker three is already, uh, it's already watching, it's already in line. We see it here in the list. And then we see uh, worker two is already on this list of online workers. Um, and worker two creates a task. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's asking for some available machine to run a command. And so it creates this tasks node. Uh, and as soon as it does that, through the watch, it notifies everybody who's subscribed or who's listening to that watch. And so uh, workers one and three are both notified. And if worker two is listening, then it would also be notified. But that's, um, that gets a little bit more complex. So let's not get into those kinds of details yet. Now let's say worker one, uh, it decides to pick up this work first, and so it sets a distributed lock on the task, and so nobody else can can pick it up. This kind of distributed lock ensures that this is the only worker that will be working on it. Um, and this is fine and dandy, but then what happens when worker one dies? Um, well, um, in other kinds of applications, this could be a big problem, but in a distributed application, there are patterns behind how to handle this. Now. Let's say that it could be that there was a network partition and suddenly, you know, you can't communicate with worker one. And so in either case, Zookeeper has determined that worker one is unresponsive. Um, and uh, so it considers the session as dead. And because it considers the session as dead, it's releasing the lock. Now in Pulsar, uh, there's, there's a fencing architecture behind how this works. And that's also out of scope of this presentation. Um, there's information available online, or if you want to learn more about it, you can reach out to me. Um, and I won't get into the details of how Pulsar fencing works. Um, just know that Pulsar has an architecture that specifically handles these kinds of situations, and, um, and it's very good at doing that. So then, because the session is considered dead and the lock is released, um, then 
uh, then that task can be reassigned. Um, and so it can be given to, in this case, it's given worker three, um, and that work can continue. Um, so this is an example of how a distributed application can allow workloads to continue moving forward uh, even when failures are taking place. Now let's talk about Apache Bookkeeper. Um, there are companies that are running Apache Bookkeeper uh, at massive scale. Um, so uh, like for example tens of millions of events per second. Um, so these are a few examples of companies that are running at that scale. Um, so it's stable, it's mature, it's robust, um, and it's very performant. So how does it work? Um, well, Apache Bookkeeper is based on this concept of ledgers. Um, a ledger is very simple. It's designed for, for sequential writes. And at the top of the ledger, there's a last confirmed entry. And so as more entries continue, um, it simply adds or it pens those entries to, to the ledger. And that's how we keep track of the information. Um, so you can have multiple ledgers, and they can, uh, they can be written to at the same rate or at different rates, it doesn't really matter. But instead of keeping each ledger in its own location of, in the storage, um, it's striped across in a particular way that uh, also has replication, so makes it resilient to failure, um, but also very performant. Um, and so let's look at a little bit of how this works with Apache Pulsar. So in a Pulsar, I'm assuming that you're familiar with what a topic is. Um, that's basically how you're you're sending messages, so you read and write messages to and from a topic, and uh, as you're writing those messages, you create these ledgers. Um, and the ledgers have a particular storage capacity, and so once a ledger is filled up, it's closed, and so it's closed to modification, and then you open a new ledger, and, uh, and then new data goes into the new ledger. Um, and each ledger uh, can be split into fragments um, that are distributed across the storage layer as I mentioned, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and so then, uh, based on your data retention policies, you can go through and remove old ledgers. It'll just automatically handle that for you um, to make sure that you're meeting your, uh, your requirements for your retention. And so here, as we see, we've got, uh, we've got a subscription and this are multiple subscriptions that are attached to the topic the metadata that's in uh, that's stored in Apache Zookeeper as well as the ledger metadata that also goes in Zookeeper um, and then the topic is broken down into these ledgers which are split into fragments and then each fragment um, is uh, is distributed uh, into um, basically a cluster or an ensemble of bookies or bookkeeper nodes um, and you can configure um, how many bookies are required to retain that data? You can. There's a lot of thing. There are a lot of things that you can tune about um, how that how Bookkeeper handles that data, uh, and tuning Bookkeeper is also out of the scope of this presentation, so I won't go into that more. Now, Bookkeeper, uh, it you know as we kind of talked about, it guarantees read consistency in the ledgers in the presence of failures. Um, and the current version of Bookkeeper is built on RocksDB, which uses an LSM tree. Um, which is very fast, is designed exactly for these kinds of use cases, um, and that's what allows uh, these latencies, or one of the factors that allows these latencies of under five milliseconds. Um, now, some might ask, well, why separate the storage from the serving layer? Isn't that awfully complicated? Um, well, let's think about it this way. Y you know, when you separate the storage layer from the serving layer, um, it, it abstracts better um, and it scales better, right? Um, you know, you can easily scale them uh, up and down independently, and so just kind of looking at what this might look like, and you know, uh, hypothetical example, you know, you can scale them up or down. Um, you can add new clusters, you can add multiple clusters, um, and um, you can because you can scale those independently, you get the additional guarantees that the serving uh, or the storage layer provides um, without the complexity of needing to rebalance. Um, so some of those, some of the older technologies like Kafka, um, they um, they have to rebalance that data when you scale out the cluster, when you make cluster changes. Um, that can be complicated, um, and also things like geo-replication can be very difficult. Um, and so Pulsar offers much more flexibility and scalability than these monolithic messaging systems. Um, now some might get offended that I call them monolithic, but um, uh, it certainly is not as 
uh, as uh, sophisticated in the architecture as Pulsar. Um, and then one of the big highlights of Pulsar that I, I have to give a shout out to is the community. Um, the Apache community, not, not just the Apache community, the Apache Pulsar community um, is one of the most um, impressive open source communities that I've ever worked with. I've worked with a lot of open source technologies and a lot of times you, you'll send a message and want to chat, you know, um, uh, media like, you know, whether it's, you know, one of the email groups or, uh, or Slack or, you know, in a forum somewhere and maybe you'll get an answer, maybe you won't, and maybe it'll be brief and they won't really help you or, um, I have not experienced that with the Apache Pulsar community. They are so many people who are so eager to help you succeed. Um, I can't guarantee that every one of your messages or questions will be responded to, but especially if you work on building relationships with those in the Pulsar community, um, they, are, um, they are very open to helping you succeed. And of course, one of the best ways that you can build those or strengthen those relationships is uh, to contribute to, to Pulsar. Um, and so just to kind of wrap this talk up, uh, a couple of quotations that, um, that, are, um, that speak words about Pulsar. Um, I'll just read them. So uh, Pierre from OVH Cloud said, internally we've been running Apache Kafka, a Kafka for years, and despite all the skills obtained from operating multiple clusters with millions of messages per second, we decided to shift and build the foundation of our new messaging product based on Apache Pulsar. The overall architecture with Apache Bookkeeper greatly facilitates multi-tenancy, scalability, and operations, and provides new features like, Pul like Pulsar SQL with Presto. And then one of the tech leads at Tencent, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to butcher his name, so <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Um, he said, Pulsar provides us with a highly consistent, highly reliable distributed message queue that fits well in our financial use cases. Multi-tenant and storage separation architecture design greatly reduces our operational and maintenance overhead. We have used Pulsar on a very large scale in our organization and we are impressed that Pulsar is able to provide high consistency while supporting high concurrent client connections. And if you want more resources about Pulsar or if you need uh, ammunition, uh, maybe on the business case, I've got a great video on that, uh, this top one of why streaming Pulsar. Um, if you want to get into the weeds of how Pulsar works, um, Jack Van Lightly has uh, a great uh, post about that. And then if you want to get into performance tuning, I co-authored an article um, on that. And so, and then also the references from the survey are here. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. My contact information is in the, is in the start of this presentation on that first slide. All right, thanks so much.